Welcome everyone to today's devotion. We're in John chapter 18, where we look at the um, arrest and the trial of Jesus. What is striking about John's um, uh, view of things, how he lays it out, is um, not just what is there, but also what is missing. Uh, we won't be able to look at all of it, uh, but there are some places where he is very brief, um, other places where he gives more details, uh, and then he, he skips over some other things. And the reason that is, I believe, um, is because John's first readers uh, would have been familiar with one of the other Gospels. I think it's Matthew or Mark, but I can't really prove that right now, or they certainly don't have the time to, to try. Um, so um, we're familiar with what we have here, but we do see a different perspective in John. So go down to verse 4. Uh, Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to um, Judas and the uh, band of robbers, if you will, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, who, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. Now, a lot of people in this passage to say it's, it's, it's somewhat bizarre, the idea of people falling back because of, of Jesus' words. Um, to the modern here, that, that is, it's, it, it, it just comes off as, as bizarre. Uh, but we have to remember um, what the Bible is saying about Jesus in light of a biblical worldview. You'll notice here that the emphasis is not on Judas. The synoptics do that because they really develop the character of Judas a little more. The emphasis here is on the nature of Jesus. And so you don't have Judas kissing Jesus. You don't have him speaking at all. Judas, uh, we're told, is the one who's betraying Jesus. But, but beyond that, we're not really told anything about him. The emphasis is on Jesus himself. So on the one hand, um, he, uh, John's going to emphasize Jesus fulfilling scripture that he protected his, his disciples. That's a fulfillment of the Old Testament and whatnot. But the real emphasis is on the I am's. One of the things I like to do when people read through the Gospel of John, or they want to know how to begin reading through the Bible, uh, I tell them to start with John's Gospel and to highlight the words I am and signs. And we've looked at the signs, we've talked about them, and we've discussed some of the I am statements. I'm the bread of life, I'm the resurrection of life, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the door, I'm the light of the world, uh, so on and so forth. Well, the word I am in Johannine theology um, takes us back to um, the burning bush. And so what John is doing through the proclamation of Jesus and through this literary tool is he's hyperlinking to who Jesus is. Jesus is the angel of the Lord, the Yahweh, who, who spoke to Moses at the burning bush. So you remember that uh, when Moses asked, who are you? What is your name? Um, the the uh, God at the uh, burning bush says, I am that I am. And that is the, the, the etymology of the word Yahweh. He is the great I am. Now, Jesus here is making the same claim for himself. At times, it's an association with life, light, logos, lamb sort of stuff. Uh, but here, it's explicitly stated. He did the same thing in John chapter 8. Uh, before Abraham was, I am. Here he says it three times. What we have here is like Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy. I am, I am, I am. And in ancient Hebrew, somewhat in Greek, but really in ancient Hebrew, if you wanted to emphasize something, you would repeat it. So, for example, in John chapter 1, um, uh, it was evening, it was morning, it was good. It was evening, it was morning, it was good. It was evening, it was morning, it was good, right? Over and over again. Um, uh, look how many times we, we're told that man is made in the image of God, you know, for, for, for example. And so, so we see something similar here. And as he proclaims to be the great I am, there is a response even from those who are coming to arrest Jesus. And so John is writing in such a way that, that he wants the reader to, to understand who Jesus is and how we should respond to that. We are standing on holy ground. That God himself has come down, not in the presence of a burning bush, but in flesh itself. 
and to stand in all of the incarnation. Verse 10, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father's given me? Again, there's so much here, and we have a long chapter. So forgive me for, for not going to the depth that I, I would like to. Here comes Peter. He grabs a sword. This is typical. Everyone would grab a sword. I grew up in a rural community where everyone had a pocket knife. Everyone still has a pocket knife, right? That became a problem after Columbine when you weren't allowed to have, you know, guns in the back of your truck or a knife in your pocket. Um, but everyone at this time would have had some sort of, of a weapon on them, very common. Um, and so Jesus, or Peter takes it, just starts swinging. Now, it is my belief that Peter wasn't aiming for Malchus's ear, probably aiming for, for his head. But you'll notice that we're given the name of the servant and nothing else about him. Simon swinging, hits the high priest's servant's ear, his name was Malchus, the end. We don't know anything else about Malchus. Now, you can find goofy stuff in, in, in traditions of the church, but, but in terms of what we really know about Malchus, we don't know anything about him. Nothing. The Bible never addresses him. He's, he's just mentioned here. And you'll notice that the Synoptic Gospels never give us his name. They all mention the story. And so one of the things that may be helpful for you to think about, particularly when it comes to uh, apologetics, is how often the Gospel writers, well, one writer will give us the name but the others won't. So Mark tells us about blind Bartimaeus, but in the other Gospels, he, he's just a blind man. Uh, we get several of these stories. This is one of those. Uh, why is it important that we have uh, Malchus's name? It's because what the biblical writers do is they provide for the reader uh, some of their eyewitnesses. And we know they spoke to eyewitnesses. Luke tells us explicitly in, in his first four verses of, of his book. He's putting together an orderly account of eyewitnesses. And so, although the writer of John is an eyewitness, that's made very evident in this chapter, that he, he, he leads Peter into uh, the courtyard near where Jesus is having his trial, um, because he, he knows the high priest. Uh, so he's clearly an eyewitness, and is written from an eyewitness perspective. At the same time, people, uh, other eyewitnesses are consulted as well. Malchus is one of them. But you see that Jesus is saying, put away your sword. And the synoptics will say, those who live by the sword die by the sword. But John adds, um, shall I not drink the cup the Father's given me? Now, that's a reference to the Garden of Gethsemane. But John doesn't have the Garden of Gethsemane in the way we traditionally think of it. We get the high priestly prayer in the Garden. Um, but in the synoptics, we get this language of the cup. What John does with cup language is that is part of water language. And the language of being thirsty. So remember, in, in John chapter 2, there is the turning water into wine, the old into new. In John chapter 4, it's uh, anyone who drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst again. right? And, and we get this talk of, of John who will baptize you, not just with water, but with, but with the Holy Spirit. So we get this water language, Jesus walking on the water. And then, and then coming off of feeding 5,000, he says, if those who come to me will never hunger or thirst again. This is a theme. It's, it's, it's sort of under the surface, but it's, it's there. And we've looked at some of these. It will climax in Jesus a saying from the cross, I am thirsty. Why is he thirsty? Because he is drinking from the cup of the Father's wrath. It's, it's, it's fantastic, isn't it? Because what it is he is drinking from, from the cross, vinegar and water will not satisfy him. Because that's not the cup he's drinking from. That's not why he's parched. And we, we, we see this, that process continuing right here. Shall I not drink of this cup? This is why I've, I've come here. Remember, he is the lamb. In fact, we, we see that lamb language th throughout this, and, as, and we'll, I'll point it out as we come to it. Uh, so, so he gets arrested. He goes, faces Annas and Caiaphas, the they, they switch back and forth, the high priest. So they lead him, verse 13, to Annas. Verse 14, he's in Caiaphas. Um, and, and John says, It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. To remind you, this is, this is Jesus as lamb. He's demonstrated he's logos, I am. But now we see as logos, he's, he's really a lamb. Verse 15, we start uh, in, in two parts, the denial of, of Peter. Uh, Peter followed Jesus, so did another disciple, this is probably John. Uh, since the disciple was known to the high priest, he entered in with Jesus to the courtyard of the high priest. 
But Peter stood outside at the door, so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and, and brought Peter in. So this is the beginning of it. And notice that the, the you have Peter's denial, but it's, it's, it's not as dramatic as the others. In fact, it's interrupted with the high priest questioning Jesus. So you get Peter starting the denial, and then, then you have the end of the Nile, and in the middle is the trial of Jesus. So, so John puts together, while Jesus is on trial, Peter is on, he's, he's on a trial himself, but he fails. Right? Whereas Jesus succeeds in his mission, Peter ultimately fails and uh, fulfills the prophecy Jesus gave him. So verses 25 to 27, Peter is still denying Jesus. Uh, verse 27 is when a rooster crows. Verse 28, Jesus is led to Pilate. Um, so he goes from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It says there in verse 28, uh, It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. Now, now the irony there is pretty rich, isn't it? Here are people who are um, corrupting justice, but in corrupting that justice, they are handing over the the Passover lamb. But because they're blinded, to you Johannine imagery, they're blinded by their uh, religious rituals. They they will sacrifice the lesser lamb. So they so though they are dirty and unrighteous, they they are claiming to be clean. They are blind, but they claim to see. Uh, and so what we see here is Jesus being handed over as a lamb to slaughter. Here is the lamb of God, ready to be sacrificed at the Passover. So Pilate speaks to him. I, I got a lot here, but I don't think we're, we're going to have a lot of time for, for Pilate. Um, verse 31, Pilate said to him, Take him yourself and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It's not law for us to put anyone to death. Now, this doesn't mean the Jews didn't put people to death. They did all the time. Look at Stephen. Right? They didn't mind putting people to death. The the woman caught in adultery, we, we didn't look at for various reasons. I don't have time to. In John 8, um, they clearly were ready to, to stone her. There's plenty of examples of this. Um, uh, James, the apostle, is, is, is executed. Um, but what they want is for legal executions to take place, they have to go through Rome. And so Pilate, as you get in synoptics, wants to hand Jesus over. What does he care about theological debates? But they want him dead, and they, they want their hands to be clean from it. So uh, verse 33, G, uh, Pilate asks Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? The only question that really matters to Pilate. Um, and Jesus ultimately answers, verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Now, John doesn't develop the kingdom of God as, as, as much as synoptics. I think it's because they have that language in the synoptic gospels, at least in one of them. But nevertheless, we, we see here what Jesus comes to bring is not earthly. Remember what he said to, to uh, Nicodemus, how will you believe heavenly things when I tell you if you can't understand earthly things? Jesus comes down from heaven and he brings with him heaven's kingdom. Um, now, now, I think it is worth pausing here for application that one of the problems with American evangelicalism in general right now is that we are looking for an earthly kingdom. It doesn't mean that we, we don't want to make the world a better place. We, we do. The problem is, is that we are emotionally um, driven um, and affected by elections more than we should and by uh, decisions made uh, in, in the public square more than we should and direction of the culture more than we should because we're trying to build an earthly kingdom. Jesus didn't come to bring an earthly kingdom. It doesn't mean, again, these things don't matter. You should vote, all that sort of stuff. I vote primaries, generals, all of that sort of stuff. What it does mean is that our focus is on a heavenly kingdom that is um, uh, invading the earth itself. So our primary, our primary concern is not who holds the power because we believe Jesus is the one who holds all the power. And thus our calling is is the Great Commission. Anyways, that would probably get me in trouble. Um, verse 37, Pilate said to him, So are you a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. 
For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Well, that is John 10 language. Sheep hear my voice and obey me. They follow me, right? But you see emphasis on truth. Very Johannine in, in his epistles. Here's Pilate's answer. What is truth? Now, people go crazy over this, and, and I find it striking considering we live in a postmodern age where truth is relative, and truth be- is a means of power. And so the way it works is, is, is particularly leftism um, didn't believe in truth until they were in power, right? We, we get that sort of way postmodernism works. It's where political correctness comes from, all this, this sort of stuff. Postmodernism uh, is the culture in which we live in. We don't see it and understand it in the way that a fish doesn't understand wetness. Um, so that is striking, but really this is in the context of what Jesus is saying. Uh, what we see here is Pilate, though he sees Jesus, is blind. So his question makes sense in light of the, the broader narrative. Uh, and then notice what Pilate can, concludes. He makes a truth statement after asking what, what is truth. Now the answer to Pilate's question is given by John in his writings. What is truth? It's a person named Jesus who, if you will believe in him, you will know um, salvation and you will live by the love of God. It's Johann 9 theology in a nutshell. But Pilate says, verse, at the end of verse 38, I find no guilt in him, but if you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover, so do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Notice, John isn't interested in the details of this. He, he's, he's including it because uh, it's part of the narrative. Uh, but the synoptics give you the detail of Barabbas, which we've looked at when we looked at Matthew and, uh, and Luke. Uh, but you see what is important to John is to say that the king is innocent, though he will be uh, betrayed and executed, which is consistent of the rejection part we saw in um, chapters 7 to 11 and um, the, 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 the warning Jesus gives the disciples that he's going to be executed. So we see the, the three climaxes coming into play here. Well, that's everything in chapter 18. Uh, Lord willing, tomorrow uh, we'll look more at the actual crucifixion of Jesus, which is the climax, um, the crucifixion, resurrection, uh, resurrection of Jesus, the climax of the Christian faith, and it's the center of everything. Hope to see you guys here tomorrow.